This is Cameron Crowe. You guys know, famous director and writer. He did Fast Times at Ridgemont High, Vanilla Sky, Almost Famous, Singles, Jerry Maguire, Elizabethtown, Say Anything. And this is Carmen Keegan's Harvey. Carmen has been on my channel before. In fact, she sang on one of my videos the song Wild Horses by the Rolling Stones. Here it is. This is Carmen and Cameron Crowe together. You're probably thinking, why are Carmen and Cameron Crowe together? Back in 2005, I signed a band, a four-piece band, from Columbia, South Carolina, really Orangeburg, South Carolina, to a production deal. It's the only band out of the 25 years I worked as a music producer that I signed to a production deal. This is a letter that I got from Cameron Crowe that I'll tell you about here in a minute. Back in 2005, I got approached by a guitarist named Brian, Brian Whitman. And he wrote to me about his band, I-9, that Carmen was the singer of. And said they'd really like for me to check out their music. And I didn't do anything about it. I didn't even listen to it. My assistant, Ken, listened to it. And he said, this is really good. You should check it out. So a couple months went by. Every time Ken would say to me, you should really check out I-9. I think you're going to like it. So finally, Brian said, listen, Myself, Brian, and their cellist in the band, they had a cellist, his name was Brian as well, Brian Gibson, said they were coming to town and they wanted to see if they could have lunch with me, take me out to lunch. And, I, and Ken said, you need to listen to this. I said, all right, play it. So he plays, I said, wow, this is amazing. Who is this? He goes, this is the band I've been telling you about for the last three months. So the guys come here to Atlanta and meet me at the studio I was working at, at the time and we went out to lunch. And they said, we're playing a gig at Eddie's Attic. Eddie's Attic is a club in Decatur, Georgia. It's not far from here. I just said it's Atlanta. We want you to come to it. So I was like, okay. So I go to the thing, and it's a battle of the bands. I get there just before they're ready to go on. I'm standing there, and all of a sudden, they come out. Four-piece band. Acoustic guitar, cello, bass, and a female vocalist with shiny blonde hair. And they start their first song, and all of a sudden, I'm thinking... Wow, this is unbelievable. This singer was so charismatic and had one of the best voices I'd ever heard. Blew me away. So they end up winning this battle of the bands, and the band comes out to meet with me. I'd met the two Bryans, but I meet Carmen for the first time, and I said, you guys were amazing. Blew my mind. And they told me that they were planning on moving to Atlanta in the next few weeks. So they move here. And I get together with them. We start talking. And I said, I'd really love to record you. I thought about it. And I said, um, I want to sign you to a production deal. Now, I've never signed any band. They're the only band ever in 25 years that I signed to a production deal. They didn't have any resources or anything to make a record. And I thought, I really believe in this. This is incredible. I want to make a record with these guys. And it's going to take some work. They have to find a drummer. We got to do pre-production and maybe six months down the road, we'll make a record whenever they're ready. So we start doing that over the course of probably about two, three months or so. And in the meantime, I start working on a record with Trey Anastasio from Fish. And we were here in Atlanta. When I'm working with Trey, I said, oh, we should get Carmen to come and sing some backup vocals. I said that to myself and I brought her into the studio when Trey wasn't there and Carmen sang on one song. And Trey came in the next day and was blown away. He said, who is this? This is unbelievable. So I had Carmen come up to the studio. And funny thing is that the night before, the band was playing again at Eddie's Attic. And I said, here's 20 bucks. Have Shalom, the sound guy, who was actually the sound guy originally for Jellyfish. He was the sound guy at the club. Have him record your set so I can hear it. He always did great board tapes. So Carmen comes up to the studio to meet Trey and hands me the CD. Here's a CD from last night's gig. And then Trey starts talking to Carmen. He says, what is, you're in a band? She said, yeah. She's, what do you sound like? And so... I said, well, let's check, out the, uh, let's check out the disc. So I play it, and I listen to a second of it, and Trey says, did you write this? She said, yeah, we wrote this as a band. Anyways, the next day I was going to New York City. Trey was playing at Carnegie Hall. And I had some meetings set up with some record label presidents, actually. One of them was this guy, Avery Lipman, who was the president of Universal Records, and, and a couple other labels. But high-up people. 
presidents of labels, right? So I go there and I'm meeting with Avery's great guy. And I'd done some work for, for, I'd had bands signed to Universal Records recently. One's a Johnny Diamond. If you watch that video about Johnny, that Johnny had found that had signed to Universal. And so I'm meeting there with Avery and he says to me, is there anything new that you're working on? I said, I actually signed a band to a production deal that I'm, I haven't gotten in the studio with. He says, really, what do they sound like? I said, they're kind of like a, I don't know, like a female Led Zeppelin or something like that. The singer's amazing, rock singer, but it's got these folk elements to it, rock elements, uh, really nothing like you've heard. He goes, do you have anything to play? I said, well, I got this board tape from that they gave me last night. Well, let's play it. Now, I'd only listened to a couple seconds of it, and I'm thinking like, should I play this for the guy? I was like, yeah, I'll play it. So the thing comes on, and it starts playing this one song called Ickes Wish. Check it out. I'm hoping you're tripping over me in there. I'm watching you from under your arms. I'm hoping you're tripping over me I'm there. I'm there. He listens to this, to the first, right through the bridge of it. He said, this is unbelievable. Let me hear another song. Skip to the next song. Said, this is amazing. I want to see this band. It's like, okay. So I go to my next meeting and it was with the president of Columbia Records. And I was like, he said, what are you working? I said, I got this band. I'm, I'm in town for Trey. I've got this band, I-9, that's uh, that I signed to a production deal. I just played it for Avery Lippman. He's coming down to, to Atlanta to see, see him play. Oh my God, let me hear this. Play it for him. And then I went to another meeting. I forget what, it was another label president. And this, I probably, it was about four different label presidents over the course of two days. I go back home the next week at my place that I was living. I was living in a loft at the time, uh, another part of town. And it was big, you know, one room loft with a big echoey sound. And I started having these A&R guys showing up. By that, by the next week, Everyone in the music industry had heard about this band and heard this <laughs> this live board tape, right? And probably the funniest thing that happened is I came home from somewhere and I saw I had an answering machine message and I listened to it and I hear, uh, Rick, yeah, it's Clive Davis. I really love the I-9 thing. I'm thinking, I-9, Clive Davis has it? He's calling me at home? I, I mean, I've not gone in the studio with the band yet. All I had done is pre-production for a few months with them. So... They start pulling up to, to my place at the time, and I set the band up in a semicircle. And I forget who, who came first, some, some head of A&R for some label. Lim limos were pulling up literally outside. They come into my place, and the band sang, and they just blew them away. Then we would go and eat lunch, come back. It'd be That was at noon. And then at four, another limo would pull up and be another person from a label. And there were about seven labels that came over a two-day period. It wasn't just labels, it was managers. Uh, the manager for Motley Crue, Alan Kovac came down, and Gary Gersh, who is the guy that signed Nirvana to Geffen back in the 90s. He was came down to meet the band as well. Then the next thing that happened is uh, they wanted to see the band live up in New York. They wanted to fly them up there. So the next week, we go up to New York, and they start playing the, at these uh, different record labels. They went into Columbia Records and they played for the president of Columbia Records and the whole staff, maybe 30 people, all the A&R people for, for, that worked at Sony, you know, Columbia Records, Epic Records, all those things. And the band never played a bad set. Over the course of, the, of a few weeks, they played about 25 showcases in the highest pressure situations with everybody from Clive Davis to Donnie Einer from Sony to you name it. All the heads of every label with under the most highest pressure gigs, and they killed it every time. So in the meantime, I'm going out to, to L.A., and I'm working with Trey. And one morning, I'm at Bob's Big Boy eating breakfast before I go into the studio. And I get this call. Rick, it's Cameron Crowe. I was like, I mean, how many Cameron Crows are there? I was like, uh, what's up, Cameron? 
He's like, where are you? You sound like you're out someplace. I said, I'm at Bob's Big Boy over in Burbank. He says, you're kidding me. I go, I go there all the time. I said, like, cool. The reason I'm calling you is because I got the i9 live tape. And I said, okay. He said, it's one of the best things I've ever heard. It's one of the best live gigs I've ever heard. And I have a new movie I'm doing called Elizabeth Town, and I want them to do the closing credits song. Now, the band's not signed anything. They're just signed to my production company. Is this something you'd be interested in? I said, absolutely. So Cameron said, well, I don't have the song finished yet. When we get it done, we'll send it to you guys so you can rehearse it, and then we'll figure out about the recording of it. I said, okay, cool. In the meantime, I gave him Carmen's phone number. He really wanted to talk to her. So they start talking, and Cameron said, Carmen, I want to send you something. She said, okay. So Cameron sends these two boxes of LPs to Carmen to listen to. These are his favorite LPs. Well, they happen to be the LPs that his sister gave to him. Now, if you know the movie Almost Famous, that's about Cameron Crowe. That's, he became a writer for Rolling Stone magazine when he was 15. These are the same records that they talk about in the movie. This song explains why I'm leaving home to become a stewardess. We can't talk. We have to listen to rock music. So in the meantime, I'm working on all these projects and, and Cameron calls me and says, okay, I got the song that I'm going to send to you. And he was married to Nancy Wilson from Heart at the time. He says, Nancy's going to send it to you and we need it by tomorrow. We're going to mix it in LA tomorrow. Now we haven't even recorded it yet. Okay. This is four o'clock in the afternoon. We need you to fly to LA tomorrow for the mixing session. We're going to have this guy, Jack Joseph Puig, mix it. Nancy's going to meet you there. I was like, Okay. So they send me the song. I ran out of Jack in Tripoli. Oh, those freedom fighters, they were good to me. It's a song called It's the Same in Any Language that Cameron wrote the uh, lyrics and Nancy wrote the music to. So I get it and I said, all right. So I called the man and said, listen, we need to book time at a studio and we have a session at 7 p.m. So we went to this place, Tree Sound, to record the song. In the meantime, we're figuring out how to play it, play it for the band. They're like, okay, we got it. And we record the song. Next day I get on a plane, I fly to LA. I meet Nancy Wilson at the studios at Ocean Way and I meet Jack Joseph Puig, who's the engineer. And it was an honor, I love heart. Nancy Wilson is, I mean, she's just amazing, right? So we start talking and we're there for the whole session. Now Cameron never came to the session, he couldn't make it down. So that happens. The song's going to go in the movie. In the meantime, the band gets offers from about seven different label, labels, massive record offers. I said to them, you guys, I mean, they're signed to, to my production company, but I'm not going to make decisions for who they should sign with. They need to make the decisions. Because uh, I don't want to be the guy that, like, oh, well, you made me sign with this label, and, and uh, if it doesn't work out, then I'm the guy that, you know, <laughs> it's to blame for it. I'm, I didn't want to be responsible for that, so... I said, you need to, you met with all these people, you need to decide who they should work with. So they decided to go with RCA Records. This is where it started to go really uh, sideways, as they say, and that's Clive Davis. And the A&R guy, that's the guy that actually signed the band to the deal. He's the guy that you interface with every day. He, last I heard, was out of the music business and he had bought a couple laundromats in LA. <laughs> that's what he was doing. So we go to LA, to, to start recording this. And they made me work with this engineer and we were working at the studio in LA, the Village Recorder. Well, John Mayer had a room upstairs at the Village Recorder. And John was, uh, his manager was ma started managing the band, his manager at the time, he's not with him anymore. And John came down to meet the band. And I knew John from here, from Atlanta, because John used to play Eddie Zadig, where the band got signed from. John used to play just like anybody else. He'd play a set of his own original music back in 99, 2000, before he got a record deal. I have the, I start recording some of these songs, and I had some demos, and, and I was doing some editing on some stuff. The band had left, and, and I was going through listening to some tracks, and John came down to the studio, and, and he said, can I hear something? And it was just me and John there. And I said, yeah, let me play. So I played this song. But I'll be there, yeah. I'll be there, yeah. 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 Of you still, baby, smile, baby, smile.
So John's listening to it and he's like, that's amazing. Wow. The singer is incredible. I mean, this is really great. And I said, well, they're coming back. So they came back, John met the band and um, it was really, really cool. Then this is where everything started going south. The A&R guy decided that he was going to take control of the project and push me out. It started with him saying, you know the song, I'm Alive? Yeah. Well, here, I want you to check out my four-track demo of it. This is how I think the song should go. He's playing it for me and the band. I'm like, wow, the band's all looking at each other. Like, what? <laughs> and it was horrible. He can't even play anything. He couldn't play the song right. And he actually made up the, his own arrangement for it. And he started to, to tell the band that this is his vision for the song. In addition, he's like, I'm going to fly Josh Freeze out to play drums on the demo. You're going to have Josh Freeze. Josh Freeze, who plays in a perfect circle and is a top L.A. session drummer, he's going to fly to Atlanta to play drums on the demo. So you can imagine where this is going from here. And slowly but surely, this guy started to make decisions and make it impossible for the band to do anything artistically that they wanted to do and make it impossible for me to be part of the project. So he just muscled his way in using his position as the a &R guy and then essentially forcing them to do things because they were signed and they had no choice at this point. This is how the record business used to be, right? They signed this record deal. They have all this excitement and everything, but one person that's in control, convinces the label that this is their vision for this. They don't care about the band, and then they force the band to do that. And if they don't, they'll either just shelve the record, not put it out, and the band is stuck, and they can't do anything. It's over. Because I told them, when you sign a record deal, that's the beginning of the end. There's two things that can happen. Either you have success, and you get to make more records, or more, <laughs> more likely, the record flops, and you get dropped, and that's it. So getting signed is really the beginning of the end. There was no internet at the time. Well, there was internet, but there was no YouTube or anything where you could build a following organically and actually make a name for yourself as an independent artist. I mean, if they came out today, no problem. No problem. So this ended up becoming a complete disaster. Within probably two months, I was off the project. And they started putting them with all these songwriters and writing these horrendous songs. The band wanted no part of it, but they had no choice. They literally had no choice in this. So after about a year of the label spending all this money, bringing in all these songwriters and ruining everything about the band, forcing them to do all this stuff that they didn't want to do, they ended up not even playing on the record, I don't think, or maybe one of them did. Carmen sang on it. She hated the stuff. The record got released, or a couple songs got released, then the a &R guy got fired, the band got dropped, then they went on to do other things. In fact, the cellist, Brian Gibson, went on to play with Chris Cornell. So all this happened 15 years ago. After the band broke up, everyone went their own ways. But last fall, Brian Whitman, the guitar player, called me up and said, you know what? We've been writing some songs together, and we're going to do some recording. I said, really? I said, yeah. So they finished a record, and they sent it to me. And they're calling themselves Heavy Ways the King, which happened to be the title of the record that they hated from back then that was on RCA or J Records or whatever it was. Let me play you a little bit. Here's another one.
By the way, this note says, this is from Cameron before they even did Elizabethtown. Dear Rick and all you hallowed I-9ers, here's my script. Hope, hope you like it a hundredth as much as I love your music. Very best, Cameron. Cameron was really the one that got this all started. He had the vision. He heard that initial live board tape and knew there was something important there. But all it takes is for one record label to screw everything up. Let's hope this is a story of redemption, though. Maybe I-9 or Heavyweights the King becomes something in 2020. That's all for now. Please subscribe here to my Everything Music YouTube channel. If you're interested in the Beato book, go to my website at www.rickbeato.com. The new Beato book 4.0 is out. Check it out. Check out the new Beato ear training program. If you go to beatoeartraining.com, watch the introduction video. And if you want to support the channel even more, think about becoming a member of the Beato Club. Thank you so much for watching.